In Lent week one, we explored the Lenten practice of saying no. It is easier, remember, to say no to, no to something when you've already said yes to something else. As those who follow Jesus, each of us constantly gets to choose no or yes. Will I do this or will I do that? How will I use the time and resources that I have been given? That's a stewardship question. In week two, we looked into being a blessing. We've been blessed in order to be a blessing to others. And we look deeper into that stewardship question. As people of faith, it's up to each of us to decide how are we going to use everything God has given us. In Lent week three, as we thought about the stewardship of our time, we explored the Lenten practice of worship that is regular and often. And last week, as we responded to our congregation's invitation to be generous, we contemplated the beginning of Psalm 23 and the Lenten practice of contentment. We compiled an appreciation inventory. Now it's one week before Palm Sunday, and Jesus enters Jerusalem for the last time. It is one week before Holy Week, and Jesus' last days before he's handed over to the authorities and crucified. It is one week before the powers of empire and greed seem to win again. It is one week before the beginning of the end. We stand with Ezekiel and we stare into a valley filled with dead, dried human bones. What a sight. As far as you can see, nothing but bones, ankle bones, arm bones, leg bones, shoulder bones, and none are connected. The empty eye sockets of the bleached human skulls stare into oblivion. Death reigns in this place. Endings, sorrow, grief. This is a valley of futility and hopelessness. It's a feeling that many people know all too well. Depression, grief, hopelessness. You ask yourself, why bother? If you have an experience of this and are comfortable sharing it, do so with your, your friends. They don't know it yet, but there are some close followers of Jesus who will know this experience all too soon as they watch their Messiah, their teacher and friend, their hope hang on a cross and die. What might God do in this impossible situation? It's a really good question, you know. Maybe the only question that matters. What might God do in this impossible situation? Thankfully for us, we know the answer in each of those past situations. In the vision that Ezekiel has, God has Ezekiel do the strangest thing, prophesy to the bones. Yet when he does, the rattling begins, joining bone to bone, sinew, muscle, organ, skin, and spirit breath, life, hope, a future for God's beloved people. Then there's the disciples. I know we're getting a little ahead of the story here, but they can't believe it. They watch as everything they had hoped for unravel around them, and they are powerless to do anything. Jesus seems to embrace it, preparing them during his last meal with them, calling them to prayer in the garden, commanding them to love, not fight, when he is taken away. How can this be? Seeing his battered and abused body as he comes out of the Roman garrison and is led to the Hill of the Skull, watching as Roman soldiers strip him and nail him to that wooden cross as he dies a public and shameful death. Some of the disciples have it together enough to take, his, to take possession of his body and bury it as best they can. The rest of his followers scatter and cower. What might God do in this impossible situation? Resurrection, on the third day an empty tomb, vindication, life, 
hope, a future for God's people. Which I think leaves us asking the question differently for ourselves in our present situations. Instead of a question of abandon and surrender, oh, what might God do in this impossible situation? As if the situation is beyond God's help. It becomes a question of faith and hope. What might God do in this impossible situation? I wonder. Let's find out. Let's watch for it and expect it. For God is surely in this place and time. God is surely about God's mission in our lives and through our lives. What might God do in this impossible situation? Because God will do something. Not often what we expect, granted, but God will do something. Something that brings new life. Something that transforms and heals and renews something unexpected and unforeseen. Who'd have thunk it? When you ask the question, what might God do in this impossible situation? You are activating your faith. You are opening yourself to God. You are reaching out and grabbing on to hope, even creating hope for yourself and those around you. Because as long as you can think of one answer, there is hope. And that's our last Lenten practice, the practice of hope. It's a trickier one, but hang in there because it's worth it. This week, take that question with you. Wherever you go, whomever you encounter, whatever life throws at you, what might God do in this impossible situation? Maybe turn it into a prayer. Oh God, what are you up to in this impossible situation? Maybe write some creative spiritual fiction. Imagine what God might do and then write the story. Take that question with you and immerse yourself in it all week. What might God do in this impossible situation? Remember, as long as you can think of one answer, there is hope. Then come back next week one more time, ready to share a brief story of how this Lenten practice worked for you and how it helped or didn't open you up to God as you made space in your life to actively live out the way of Jesus. Amen. <music>